I'm with Jay Martin. He's going to talk about somewhere that a lot of you may not have heard of. Some of you may have. I don't know why. It's called Rennes Chateau, which is in France. I mean, you can tell that part, can't you? Um, it's a significant place, but why is it a significant place? Right, that's it. Oh, you couldn't get it, even though the recording could. Right, so okay, then I'll open that again. Um, there is a place that some of you may have heard of, some of you may not have, in France, and it is significant for some reason. Um, you can guess, you can guess that it's in France by the by the name of it, but other than that, Rennes Chateau Castle. What can we? What can you say about this place and why it's significant? Well, uh, where would you like me to start? Um, Rennes Chateau is the epicenter of a storm, uh, basically. Um, I think just to give you a bit of context as to what Rennes Chateau is. Now, I know we've uh, we spoke before, uh, usually uh, around issues pertaining to trade unionism, maybe a bit of history. Um, so this is uh, probably a bit more of an unusual um, uh, talk, if you will. Um, but um, Rennes Chateau uh, is in, it's a tiny village of maybe maybe a hundred people um, sitting at the top of a um, uh, rocky crag uh, overlooking uh, what's known as the Upper Ord Valley. Now, the Upper Ord Valley is a very interesting place in itself. Um, most civilizations have crossed through it. It's incredibly ancient, um, with uh, cave drawings dating back 22,000 years, um, through Roman occupation, Greek occupation before that, Phoenicians before then, possibly even Egyptian. Um, um, every civilization has been in the area. Um, now, specifically, the Upward Valley is known as Cathar country, um, a sort of euphemism that was uh, really used to draw a bit of tourism, really. It's, uh, uh, if any of your listeners know anything about uh, the Cathars, um, the principal city in the Ord department, which is a department named after the main river that flows through it, the River Ord. Um, the city, Carcassonne, which is uh, the like Disney for adults, a uh, huge medieval castle. Um, well, the Cathars were a group of uh, so-called uh, heretics. Um, uh, whether or not I, uh, we, we believe in such things nowadays, but certainly to the church they were. And... Um, Yes, it, it does disturb me that you can buy things like Cathar burgers now in Carcassonne, you know, which is a bit ironic given the fact that most Cathars were burnt to the stake. Um, so I suppose if you, if anyone's ever in the uh, in the Orden in Carcassonne, uh, if they ask how they want their uh, burgers cooked, maybe the answer is just Cathar. Um, but the, uh, the Cathars left their imprints in the area. Um, they um, were extant, uh, really, from the uh, first century uh, BC up until the uh, 12th, 13th century. Uh, certainly, a lot of their belief systems stayed in the area. And the Old Valley has had a um, tradition of thinking differently uh, for for many centuries. It's an incredibly left-wing part of France. Um, so the, um, the the story of Rennes Le Chateau really just, well, it, it sticks out like a sore thumb. So the, the village itself uh, overlooks uh, the towns of uh, Coiza and Montezel. In fact, the priest I'm going to talk about um, at later on, uh, Priest Sonia, um, was born in Montezal. It's a good uh, four kilometres up quite a steep 
um, incline up from the uh, valley up to a rocky outcrop. That should give you an idea as to how high up the Chateau is. And for most of its history, it shared a very similar um, uh, history to the rest of the area. As I say, uh, there most certainly was a Roman villa up there. Um, it's in the heart, as I say, of the Cathar country, um, the Pei Cathar, as they call it. Um, uh, Cathar's been a, a religious um, uh, order or heresy um, in the uh, 12th century and before. Um, there has been uh, various um, uh, buildings and uh, uh, there is a castle at the top of this um, uh, this mountain top and uh, really it's quite a poor area um, so we, we're not talking a castle with you know lovely uh, hearts and uh, you know very well to do it's it was very much a functional castle used to defend the border between France and Spain which was a lot closer to the area um, uh, in the uh, 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 17th century and before. Um, so there is a church in Rennes Chateau which has become very famous recently for its, um, uh, well, uh, for the Da Vinci Code really, more recently and before that, a book uh, written by uh, uh, Henry Lincoln known as Holy Blood, Holy Grail. Uh, which has caused quite a bit of interest uh, in the in the village, and the interest is this of a um, the village abbey or abbey uh, Francois Berenger Sonnier, who was appointed uh, as the uh, principal um, of the abbey, I should say. Um, in 1885, and for the first few years of his uh, tenureship, um, was was poor. You know, begging for you know, sort of leaks in the uh, church roof. Now, I should say the church at the time was uh, a part of the um, castle up there. It was the, um, uh, the the church. There were in fact two churches up at the top of the so with the um, church that Sonia um, uh, occupied uh, being uh, previously attached to the, the castle. But what happens a few years into his uh, uh, tenure as uh, Abbe is intriguing. Um, he discovered something. And this, what that thing was has been quite the mystery. Um, now, um, we, we know that he discovered something uh, um, of interest because he made a hell of a lot of money um, with it. Now, I don't know if you've read on um, or seen any of the, the, the theories, Michael, but uh, um, I, don't, uh, I don't know uh, which direction would you like me to, to continue with. Possibly the relation, um, the relationship with the Da Vinci Code, which. Um... Yeah, so, uh, the Da Vinci Code. Um, obviously, for those people who've read or watched the Da Vinci Code, uh, the surname Sonia um, um, will certainly be familiar, and the. Notion of the Da Vinci Code is in fact that there is a unbroken bloodline um, or families uh, dating back from today all the way back to um, Jesus Christ. In other words, there's a um, a lineage from from Jesus uh, all the way through to today um, through the speculated marriage between. Uh, Jesus and Mary Magdalene. Now, Dr. Tim Wallace Murphy in his uh, book uh, Rex Deus um, calls this this bloodline the Rex Deus families. And um, 
essentially the the link with the the plan is firstly the uh, the church at um Reynolds is uh, is often quoted as being the Church of Mary Magdalene, and there's certainly a few interesting uh, uh, statues um, and uh, murals, if you will, uh, in the church that um, uh, certainly wouldn't be what you would expect to see in a in a Catholic church. But really, the, the link predicates itself uh, upon the uh, so-called Priory of Siam, um, which will be familiar to those readers of the Da Vinci Code. Now, if we just backtrack slightly, um, so if we, we just start again with uh, with uh, Abbe Sonia. So Sonia, uh, as I say, becomes the uh, priest up in Buenos uh in the mid-1880s, in 1885. It's a very poor place. And the church, which was dedicated to Mary Magdalene, um, had, had fallen into quite some disrepair, uh, uh, neglect. We we must understand that France has gone through, um, well, a, a revolution in 1871 post the um, uh, Prussian invasion and the reunification of Germany. A few years before that, in 1848, uh, a few years before that, uh, with the end of the Napoleonic Wars, the French Revolution before this, um, France is um, it's stabilising as a country, but what we must understand is there is a lot of uncertainty uh, and there's still quite a bit of factionalism between uh, Republicans um, and monarchists. And certainly the area um, of the Ord is Republican. Now, this could come in uh, for some use um, later. Now, when Sonia uh, becomes the abbe, he drew up some plans to renovate the church. Um, and despite the fact that we, we know that he was in debt uh, in 1887, uh, he did manage to secure quite a bit of uh, uh, funding, shall we say, uh, for some renovations. And those renovations uh, apparently uh, led to him discovering something. Now, some people have discussed uh, what he discovered as being a vial with some parchments in it. Um, some have suggested it was, in fact, the Holy Grail that he, that he found up there. Uh, where presumably sort of tossed aside after uh, a long journey from um, uh, from the Middle East, who knows? But it's, but there's been lots of theories, shall we say, as to what it was that he found. Now, the most popular um, version of all of this is that Sonia found some parchments concealed uh, essentially inside um, a, a pillar um, which was sort of hollowed out, if you will. Um, so this is um, a hollow pillar, uh, the church's altar, if, if that makes sense. Now, it's alleged that some of those parchments detailed uh, royal genealogies dating back millennia uh, with enigmatic writings uh, uh, along them, uh, which seem to conceal some sort of hidden message, and that shortly after the discovery of these uh, bits of parchment, Sonia started to behave very strangely indeed. So it's alleged that Sonia and his um, officially housekeeper, probably lover, uh, someone called Marie de um would spend um, nights digging up um, uh, the cemetery. So we've just had Halloween. You can just picture it. You know, in the late 1880s, uh, midnight. You know, the full moon out, a wolf howling in the background, and you've got that typical image of the the priest and the housekeeper digging up in the cemetery. Uh, if it happened, it would be unusual uh, for practical reasons. Um, you know, with it being at night and what have you, but it does it does strike me as being a bit of the stereotypical 
you know, uh, there were there were strange shufflings in the cemetery, if that makes sense. Um, but either way, whatever was going on, uh, what we do know is that the council, the municipal council um, up in the uh, the town, lodged a uh, complaint um, with. Uh, the religious authorities, as well as some of the other authorities about the priest potentially disturbing some graves. So there was something going on, quite whether it was at night, uh, well, we don't know. Um, but there is a diary entry um, from around this, uh, this time that uh, uh, Sonia makes, and he just uses one word, which is the word secret. So we don't know if he had used these apparent parchments that were found in this hollowed out uh, 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 colomard part of the altar um, uh, and whether he used those parchments to find some treasure. Uh, now, as soon as you, you use the word treasure, of course, people begin automatically thinking of treasure chests and gold and holy grails and all of this. Now, it could very well be another treasure and that treasure is, uh, in fact, not the Saint Graal, the, uh, the French for Holy Grail, but uh, Saint Réal, uh, the Holy Bloodline, um, which is one of the speculations in the Da Vinci Code. Uh, now, the Da Vinci Code itself gets its theory from um, uh, Henry Lincoln, um, Richard Lee, and Michael Bajan's uh, work, Holy Blood, Holy Grail which speculated uh, to quite a sensation uh, in the uh, 80s, um, uh, this idea of uh, a bloodline. And you can imagine the upset it, it caused um, within certain religious communities, this idea that uh, uh, the so-called prostitute, Mary Magdalene, who even I have to say as a historian, absolutely was not. It's uh, uh, it Certainly it strikes me as a... A, a great slander against the uh, uh, the female sex, um, but this idea that she was married to to Jesus um, would certainly require quite a bit of rewriting in in uh, in Holy Mother's uh, doctrine. Um, so what we what we see shortly after this uh, now, I, I'll come back as to why why I keep saying the word allegedly. Um, so the, the idea of finding secret parchments and digging and finding something and, and all of this, um, I'll approach that, uh, uh, later. But what we do know is that he did suddenly have access to a vast quantity of money. Now, some have speculated that, uh, it was, um, Proof of a bloodline, and as such, um, he had bribed the Vatican. Uh, uh, he'd gone to Paris and bribed various um, other uh, religious officials. Um, if we know anything about the Catholic Church, I opened up uh, by talking about the Cathars. Uh, if we know anything about the Catholic Church, any form of heresy or blackmail, um, well, how can I phrase it nicely? Uh, you'd be invited along to the next church barbecue, apart from you would be the principal uh, uh, menu item. So it'd, it'd be unusual for someone to be able to bribe uh, the church. Um, now, where else he got his money from? I will give you my pet theory, um, but I'll just continue. So w we know that Sonia was indebted um, uh, by a couple of hundred francs. Um, and yet, by the time um, he has apparently discovered something, uh, he'd go to spend over 650,000 francs on renovations, not just in the church, but actually uh, for the town itself. The former um, uh, donkey track that takes you up to the, uh, that took you up to the village uh, is still visible in some parts. Um, and would have been incredibly difficult um, before Sonia got there just to get up to the village. Uh, if you imagine trying to uh, cart food and supplies and whatever else 
up four kilometres of quite a steep incline it would have been next to impossible to to do it. People did, but it would have been arduous. Um, and so Sonia paved the road up. Now, uh, I don't know about you, uh, Michael, um, uh, 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 when you start rooting behind the back of your, your sofa, um, I don't suppose you pull out uh, vast quantities of money and feel like going tarmacking outside. Um, but uh, that's exactly what he did. He built a water tower uh, for the town uh, so as to uh, uh, provide uh, uh, clean running water. These are not the actions of someone who um, is uh, is broke, who, let's just say, is living the... Uh, um, um, uh, living the, the life of chastity uh, and of uh, poverty and of uh, you know, solemn uh, reflection. Uh, now, this is someone who's spending uh, lavishly. But also just put this into a perspective. The annual earnings of a uh, priest um, at that time of uh, um, um, history is 900 francs a year. So if we just compare that to 650,000 francs to 900 francs, he, he's not using his savings. So the, the, the question and the mystery has been, well, where on earth did this, this money come from? Um, now, some of the things that he spent the money on inside the church are, uh, and outside the church are equally just really bizarre. Um, so within the church, there is a statue of Asmodeus the Destroyer. Now, whilst that's not unusual, um, the uh, statue, um, uh, yes, looks a bit menacing, but yeah, there is precedent for it. Um, as soon as you walk into the church, being confronted with a devil-like uh, um, statue uh, raises a few eyebrows. Uh, for those uh, with an inexperienced eye. Um, but really, it, it's not that that I think is bizarre. It's a huge folly, if you will, a, a neo-Gothic tower, um, which, um, well, it, it served as his library, um, and it looks like a fortified watchtower. Um, there's uh, quite a lot of uh, relatively sinister-looking statues, um, around the uh, uh, church, and uh, as I say, you know, I've mentioned the devil. It's sort of guarding the entrance to the uh, uh, the church. Um, Asmodeus, the destroyer, is is often referred to as a, a, a demon, or in legend, is the guardian of uh, Solomon's temple or Solomon's treasure, I should say. So this spending spree. Um, obviously didn't go unnoticed by any uh, uh, official, if you will. Um, the church authorities ended up investigating uh, and then suspending him on charges of mass trafficking. Now, that is to say, um, essentially, where priests would uh, sort of sell masses, you know, sell prayers, um, even if he had done that, um, whether or not he was guilty of doing this um, wouldn't account for the the amount that he spent. The going rate, I think I once worked out, uh, the going rate for um, uh, selling of prayers uh, would have required something like three times the population of Europe to be giving him uh, 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 cash, which is, which is just staggering. I, I can't really believe... Um, uh, uh, that he was doing so. Um, so we, we, we've got the mystery of where did this money uh, come from? And just before the close of World War One in 1917, just year before, uh, Sonia passes away. And for most people, um, we probably wouldn't have heard about his story if a series of events uh, a good few years later hadn't occurred. Now, I just want to, to backtrack slightly um, 
uh, to your, your, your question about the Da Vinci Code. Um, there has been a lot of hype about the um, Sonia treasures and the mystery. But there are, um, if Roman Chateau is the eye of the storm, the surrounding area is incredibly turbulent. There are some very unusual, hard to believe um, uh, things within towns and villages, um, ancient, um, incredibly ancient uh, stone structures um, overlooking the uh, uh, the valley, um, uh, places such as the Devil's Armchair, uh, other such things. Um, but Sonia's history and life himself uh, is certainly very intriguing, uh, uh, as is the area more broadly. Um, so I just wanted to say that uh, at this stage. I'm not going to go into uh, Sonia visiting his brother um, at Durban, near a, um, um, a place called Salvatare, which you know, means Land of the Saviour. Um, uh, about 40 miles due south of Vemma Chateau. Uh, I'm not going to go into the uh, um, Fountain of Love, um, in which people allege Mary Magdalene was there, will be. There's no evidence for that. The entire area is steeped with real mystery. Uh, uh, and certainly, if any of you, uh, you, your listeners, are interested in the Templars, they do feature heavily in the area, albeit. Um, if anyone wants to read further, I would just caution them. If uh, any site or book that has a direct link between the Templars and Rennes Chateau, uh, because they are tenuous. Um, well, uh, I'll just pause here before I continue up to the, the, the present day. Well, you can actually visit this place now, uh, Rennes Le Chateau. Um, certainly you can. So, Rennes Ren the chateau so it seems it was a very very um violent world then so um at the time that if you had um non-conformist beliefs you wouldn't fit in uh, uh, they would even burn people at the stake in ancient france certainly um the area um um was uh if, if you go back to to uh roman times and before um, the area was renowned for uh, the cult of Bacchus. There's certainly some Mithraic temples. Um, so, of course, the cult of Bacchus to the, to the Romans uh, was the, um, how can I phrase it, um, was, was a problem for them because Bacchus is, of course, wine, alcohol, and the phrase in vino veritas, you know, but you speak truth when you're drunk. Um, was quite a liberating idea, uh, holding truth to power. Uh, but for the Romans, it, 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 holding truth to power is a bit difficult when keeping order. By, by and large, though, uh, the um, uh, tribes uh, in the area before Rome um, 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 were, um, were, were quite peaceful, to be fair. Um, there, there are certainly there's evidence of, um, like I say, uh, cave paintings. I mean, I've just said twenty two thousand years. Um, that date keeps going further and further back. Um, um, the tribe uh, that occupied the um, Ord Valley, um, sometimes known as the uh, Ataxians. Um, the name for the larger group, if you will, is the, oh, this is going to test my memory here, it's, it's the um, Tectonas um, tribe, I would need to double check uh, my uh, spelling, but again, uh, entered into a trading relationship with Rome. Um, the problems really started when um, as Rome collapsed, um, the, the former Greek, Greek colonies at Marseille or Marsilia um, to, the, to the Greeks, um, relatively tolerant. There was certainly a very large Jewish community uh, along the um, southern coast of 
Um, I, I keep referring to the Ord. The Ord is part of a larger region known as the Languedoc, uh, or Occitania, or Septimania. Uh, there are lots of names, but we'll just stick with the Languedoc. Um, and the, um, like I said, there was a large Jewish community. In fact, probably the largest Jewish community outside of the Middle East. So this sort of ent- entertains people uh, who speculate that Jesus survived the crucifixion um, uh, with his wife and his daughter and son, Sarah and James, um, basically fled uh, Jerusalem and went over to uh, well the next safe haven, which was um, along the uh, the coast at uh, Marseille Narbonne, uh, for example. Um, there's no evidence of that, by the way, that that we can see. Uh, it's certainly speculative, but there's no evidence for it. Um, but the uh, the tribe, the, the, the correct in my pronunciation before the Tectosage um, uh, tribe, um, had it coexisted with with Rome. There was there was a, a real uh, how can I say it? real legacy of peace, uh, uh, getting on with people of different beliefs, and that really flew into the face of the uh, the church. So people. Uh, uh, the Cathars had a reincarnate belief. They were dualists. They believed as above, so below. Uh, they believed in equality uh, of the sexes. Um, the, they didn't have priests. They had parfaits, um, or uh, to translate, perfects. Um, they had a, a different uh, belief. They, they, they certainly didn't think that their body was worth anything. And so being killed, uh, it was just a shell that uh, the spirit inhabited. Now, that's the, in a nutshell, a very simplified version of one of the reasons the church, as it came in, to start burning people at the stake. Um, it could have something to do, though, with the fact that if you don't follow um, the Catholic Church, or Holy Mother, as it calls itself, you're not subject to paying tithes. So if you're Jewish, you wouldn't pay tithes necessarily, religious tithes. Um, and there certainly is an idea of uh, uh, kicking this rebellious uh, uh, into touch. I should explain that for most of the that period from the fall of the Roman Empire to the 1300s, let's say, um, the area was relatively independent. It wasn't really part of France, nor was it part of the Kingdom of Aragon. Um, it had been conquered by the Moors, the, the uh, Islamic Caliphate in Spain. Um, there were, it was a crossroads of, of various cultures, which in, in a very strange way uh, created tolerance um, and not just tolerance, but art and science and culture and history. Um, and it, it said, in fact, if the church hadn't declared a crusade, uh, I mean, most people, when they think of crusades, think of the Middle East. They probably wouldn't be thinking about southwest France. But if it wasn't for the uh, crusades uh, against the uh, people of Albi or the Albigensian crusaders, um, as they're called, or the Cathar Crusades, uh, to some, the Renaissance would have occurred in southwest France as opposed to uh, central Italy and northern Italy. Um, so there was a lot of burning at the stake of people with different views, and the uh, we all think of the Spanish Inquisition. Really, we should be thinking about the uh, uh, Occitanian Inquisition because. It's in the Languedoc, it's in Occitan, that the Inquisition really uh, began. This said, there were certainly treasures, uh, there's certainly money um, that the Cathars um, uh, had. They had some uh, relatively large institutions, uh, and I say this, I can hear people 
wincing and wanting to argue with me. Um, but uh, it's a place called Monsegor. There was certainly a treasury uh, there. So the Cathars did have um, some money, uh, albeit uh, notionally they were not meant to um, have earthly possessions. They did, practically. They were donated to them. Um, so there's a question, well, okay, what happened to the treasure there? You then have the um, former Visigothic kingdom, um, which it is claimed, uh, and I think we can really disbelieve this, um, it is claimed that Rem the Chateau used to be the capital of the Visigothic kingdom of Septimania. I think that's a complete mistranslation of um, old texts. I think uh, the entire uh, Ord Valley was, in fact, um, the capital, but that's a different story. So, uh, yes, uh, brief history, lots of um, um, bloodshed and uncertainty following the Crusades. And just to throw in um, uh, another group, Uh, outside of the Cathars, is, of course, the Templars. Uh, The Templars did have uh, a very prominent presence in the Ord Valley um, at um, Bezu, um, for example, which you can see from the hilltop of Renmer Chateau. They had a commandery there. Well, it's it's alleged, I should say. They most certainly had um, a a commandery it's a place called Campan Sword. Um, so the Templars were in the area, and we do have in history some evidence of Cathars, um, um, uh, Cathars being uh, the uh, Templars. Um, oh, sorry, the Templars supporting the Cathars, I should say. Um, um, it, as they were being persecuted. And, of course, uh, Friday the 13th of October, uh, 1309, when the uh, Templars are uh, famously uh, slaughtered, um, which is not true either. Uh, you know, about a third of them were uh, uh, were captured. Of course, the question has been, well, what happened to their treasure? Um, and I think people look at the uh, the treasures of the Templars, the Cathars, the Visigoths, everyone's got some treasure. And they like to say, well, look, the priest at that, uh, in the 1880s, the priest at the uh, uh, village there, he obviously was the person to find this treasure. And what the Da Vinci Code does is say, well, this isn't a physical treasure. This is, in fact, a spiritual treasure. This is essentially the um, uh, treasure of knowledge, or the treasure of family, of understanding, that's been passed down various generations. Um, so, yes, very turbulent uh, place uh, for quite some time. Uh, so once the temples are disbanded, not too long later you've got a essentially uh, an offshoot of the Lollards. You've, you've got, or I shouldn't say the Lollards really, but you've got a sort of pre-Protestant, uh, pre-Lutheran uh, rebellion. You've then got the Protestants or the Huguenots as well to the French. You've then got a wave of republicanism. Um, you've then got invasions, uh, revolutions, oh, uh, throughout the 19th century. So it's quite a turbulent place, um, but I will I'll come on to where I think the, the the treasure or the money may have come from. Uh, I think the answer is a little bit more plain. Um, but yes, between 1885 and 1917, um, the uh, Sonia certainly uh, had found and had spent. Uh, he died in poverty. Um, or he, he died very poor, in fact. Um, so, where did he get the money from? Someone maybe gave it to him that wanted him to do something, perhaps, or something well, for an organisation. 
that that's where my speculation comes from. Uh, so that's that's my take. But we, we wouldn't have heard about Sonia if it wasn't for um, a man um, a, a good few years after uh, Sonia had uh, uh, had died. Um, so uh, this is uh, someone called uh, uh, Gerard Dessat. Um, and he wrote a book called The Accursed Treasure of Rennes le Chateau in 1967. Um, and basically, Dessette's book is the basis of, um, of all of the theories uh, relating to Rennes le Chateau, the myths. And, um, it, it basically sets out in French language uh, Sonia's um, story and how he apparently found some treasure um, and of course it, this book uh, is sensationalised you know it's huge seller in France um, and uh, essentially says that uh, the, the parchments that Sonia had found uh, were, were proof of a Merovingian bloodline uh, that hadn't died out with King uh, Dagobert the second, uh, who was actually assassinated in 679 AD, but actually lived on in secret to the present day. And uh, um, Sigbert the fourth, who was Dagobert's son, uh, who was thought to have died in his infancy, had in fact survived and was uh, you know, shuffled down uh, to Rennes Chateau, um, and. Uh, you know, he and all of his descendants have been buried there, and that's the the, the idea. Um, Gasset is the one of the first people to mention uh, a group uh, called the Priory of Sion. Now, I'll just say before I go into what the Priory of Sion is, um, whether whether or not it existed before the 1950s is very much up for uh, debate. Uh, I have no doubt that a group called the Priory of Sion exists today, though. And well, then essentially, um, Dissette uh, explains that the Priory of Sion is essentially a, it's a, a very secretive order that's dedicated to uh, protecting this Merovingian bloodline. Um, and one day bringing the, the descendants of that bloodline back to the throne in France. Now, I would just highlight that bit. It might come in useful uh, later on. Now, the Merovingians also claimed um, bloodline uh, descendancy from Jesus Christ, uh, from, the, from the House of David. Now, the accursed treasure... Whilst it's produced by Dissert, there is uh, someone else who um, co-authors, or I should say maybe edited uh, um, the book. Someone who, if you've read The Da Vinci Code, will be familiar with uh, that of Pierre Plantar. Um, and Pierre Plantar, who was a, uh, an eccentric, maybe, uh, we, in this country, we would call them fantasists, but in France, there is a sort of tradition of, um, I don't know, escapism, uh, uh, surrealism. Um, so you could call him surrealist, I suppose. Um, but he claims, Pierre Plantin claims that he, he himself is actually a descendant of Dagobert II, which is quite convenient when he's... Uh, uh, co-authoring a book with uh, uh, Gerard de Seth. Uh, uh, very convenient that uh, uh, he's co-authoring a book that just so happens to be about his, uh, uh, his ancestors. But, but either way, um, so like I say, it was, it, 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 the, the book was a, a success in France uh, before it uh, ends up, uh, or the theories in the book uh, explode in the UK um, uh, which is uh, by way of Henry Lincoln. So before Lincoln um, produces his book, Holy Blood, Holy Grail, which well and truly put Rennes Le Chateau on the map, um, before that he was a, um, 
uh, essentially a theatre buff. Um, you know, writing uh, plays and uh, other such things. But uh, uh, he was, um, I think at one point, a writer on Doctor Who. Um, but th- there's no doubt, and I've spoke to, to Henry about this, he picked up a book of uh, um, The Accursed Treasure and uh, essentially um, put it into a uh, a series for the BBC, um, um, basically explaining uh, what uh, the, the mystery of uh, Renaud Chateau was. Um, so, one of the things that was in the uh, the book were uh, apparent reproductions of the uh, apparent parchments that Sonia had found, and uh, he'd noticed that. Um, in, in one of these apparent parchments, there were uh, some raised letters amongst the text uh, that spelt a message. So if you imagine you've got a lot of writing um, in code, but some letters look slightly bigger than others, and the text that Lincoln uh, read, um, it was translated as, uh, to Dagobah II, King, and to Siam. Is this treasure... And he's there dead. So Lincoln thought, aha, I've discovered something. So in 1971, 72, something like that, early 70s, uh, Henry Lincoln um, uh, produced a uh, documentary uh, for Time Watch, which was called The Lost Treasure of Jerusalem. And uh, let's just say in the English-speaking world, this caused quite a stir. So there were other documentaries um, that um, were produced on the BBC on the mystery treasure of, or or the mystery priest, as we should say, of Rana Chateau. Um, And of course, this led up to the 1983 book, Holy Blood, Holy Grail, of which the Da Vinci Code borrows uh, heavily. Um, So, the notion again that uh, uh, Jesus and Mary, uh, Jesus had survived the crucifixion. Uh, uh, he and his children ended up in the south of France, or ended up uh, with a, uh, a bloodline and family. They married into the royal king uh, kingdoms, uh, etc., of Europe. Um, Um, You can imagine this caused a huge stir. Um, And lots of other mysteries tagged along. So uh, I don't really want to go too much in. I'm I'm just sort of trying to, uh, you know, whet the appetite maybe for for people who are just interested in in, in this topic. But you've got things like... uh, um, maybe some evidence as they present it of uh, where descendants uh, of these Merovingian kings are buried. So there was uh, in the 1600s, Nicolas Poussin, um, uh, who was an artist, uh, painted uh, something called the Shepherds of Arcadia, which uh, it is believed for very interesting reasons. Uh, this points out where some of the uh, some of um, Jesus' descendants actually uh, were buried. Um, there was then found in the Bibliothèque Nationale, the National Library of France, uh, something called the uh, uh, secret, the secret dossiers, um, which apparently there was um, evidence that um, this order had existed, the Priory of Sinai had existed, and uh, uh, with their duty to protect this bloodline, um, uh, some of their uh, uh, members included Newton, Hugo, Debussy, and of course, Leonardo da Vinci, uh, which of course is where the da Vinci Code gets its name, because da Vinci is apparently one of these... uh, um, uh, descendants of the 
uh, master's sort of priory of Sion, and he was sworn to defend the the bloodline. Um, so I don't know if you've got any questions just yet before I sort of speculate where I think some of this treasure came from. Yeah, I think so. Um, oh, hang on. Um, why? Um, why? Why were you able to find out some of the things that were speculated on? But you know, were the things that were speculated on? Uh, when you when you say speculated, how do you mean that we think? There was no evidence for something happening, such as, for example, uh, Jesus going along to that coast, for example. Or finding, um, but if that if that was so successfully hidden, how come there's any um, any evidence, even of the speculation about what might have happened? I, I, I think the um, I mean certainly in the southwest of France there is a tradition. Um, in fact, not just the southwest of France, in central France, of uh, the so-called Black Madonnas. And they are passed off as being um, uh, blackened due to uh, candle smoke. Which, frankly, is ridiculous. Um, so there has been a, you might say, a, a, a sort of veneer of suspicion uh, around the uh, the story about uh, the Magdalene, for example. Um, some of the speculative uh, side of it, um, this is to say this this notion of uh, uh, Jesus having children, uh, it could very well be that that has been passed down the centuries, or it could very well be that it's the uh, fantastic musings of um, of, well, some very, very good fiction writers. Um, there's so many different facets to this particular story. I wouldn't like to dismiss all, uh, but certainly can explain most. Um, so there is an idea that um, um, Mary and her children landed at... Uh, Basically, uh, Mary by the Sea. Um, uh, Sarah, her daughter, I should say, uh, with Mary, uh, sort of landed in France, and this is how it got its name. Um, now, whether that's uh, true or not is, I, I don't know. Uh, but I don't think we should dismiss immediately an oral tradition. Um, for, let's face it, uh, written history is a relatively new thing in the history of this species. Um, but I think there is uh, certainly a lot of fantasy and wishful thinking around um, some bloodline. And I think really, the whilst Ren Le Chateau is a fascinating uh, mystery and will keep many people up for, for hours reading about the the history actually turning up and going there and realizing that oh wow uh, the rest of the area uh, is unbelievably uh, uh, intriguing full of mysteries in itself um, I, I think uh, uh, I, I think for, for me I have to say uh, yes Ren Le Chateau uh, the mystery is very good um, the reality is a little bit more sobering, um, but the rest of the area, uh, now that, that really is intriguing. Um, and there are still plenty of uh, discoveries um, and plenty of history left to be written in that area. Um, I think in, in terms of the um, where the money came from, um, it could be. I, I would certainly not rule anything out. And I have to say, uh, anyone who rules out um, a plausible theory just because it's not theirs is uh, 
a very lazy scientist or a very poor historian. Um, and so plausible um, uh, theories, I should say. The, the idea that um, aliens beamed Jesus uh, down, which is um, certainly a problem uh, for a, a nearby village, um, whereby in 2012 the French army were called in um, to uh, stop uh, essentially occultist practices on the 21st of December from people who thought the mothership was going to spoon them up. Uh, you certainly do run the chateau and the mysteries of the area as this bloodline. Uh, there is a, how can I phrase this, a, a UFO culture uh, who believe that Jesus was sort of beamed up by Scotty and then beamed down and uh, there are really aliens uh, and uh, yes, I, th I think that that's not a plausible hypothesis uh, but um, I think it, uh, I, I'm certainly open to him finding uh, Sonia having found something um, but it quite what though, I don't know. I, I, I tend to think that uh, the simplest and easiest explanation is often the, uh, the correct one, uh, Occam's razor. Um, now, in, in terms of, if we just think about what's going on at the time, the France is a republic again. Uh, so it's been a republic from um, the overthrow of the monarchy. Um, it was run by a directory, um, had become a monarchy again, you might argue, an empire with an emperor, still a monarchy uh, under Napoleon. It had then uh, had, once Napoleon was uh, booted off, um, was then um, the uh, previous Bourbon uh, dynasty was then put back on the throne. There was then a Republican uh, uh, revolution, if you will. Um, then there was the restoration of Napoleon's um, uh, son, Napoleon III. And then in 1870-71, uh, Prussia invades and then France has got its third republic. So there's, there's this to and throwing between republican, then monarchist, then Bonapartist, then republican. So we, we just keep keep that in the back of our heads. Now the Bourbon dynasty, um, which were restored after the uh, end of the Napoleonic Wars in France, had very, very strong ties to the Habsburg monas uh, uh, monarch, sorry, monastery, uh, Habsburg monarchs of Austria, Hungary, which at that point in time, in the 1880s, was a vast territory, uh, occupying all of the Balkans, Croatia, a good bulk of Croatia, um, parts of northern Italy, uh, obviously Austria, all of Hungary. Romania, it's a very large entity. Um, and they had had an uh, alliance with France since the Louis XIV, or oh, the Sun King, um, uh, as some people <laughs> might know him by. Um, the thing is, um, I mean, it, it, Mary Antoinette was even... Uh, uh, Austrian. Uh, so there's this close alliance, and whilst you've got a republic, the traditions of marriage alliances um, were alive and well, uh, but if you've got a republic, uh, you don't necessarily have that. Uh, in Britain, there wasn't an issue uh, because Queen Victoria's children and grandchildren occupied the thrones of most of Europe. Now, I have I've said that the south uh, west of France is a very poor area, um, but um, and certainly a Republican one. Uh, but it might not be of any surprise to you if I say that the Catholic priest Sonia was a staunch uh, monarchist. 
Um, in fact, uh, so much so that uh, various complaints were received about him uh, for giving uh, anti-Republican sermons. Um, many uh, complaints were, uh, were were put in uh, uh, against him uh, when he became the abbe uh, or park banisher or the curé, as maybe we should uh, uh, we should actually call it. So the third, like I say, the third republic was established in 1870. By uh, 1885, um, Sonia's the the QRA, uh, and that's the 1st of June in his record from the 4th of October of the same year where he's preaching against the Republicans. So you've got this new republic, uh, Sonia's not having any of it, and he was asking his parishioners to vote for uh, a political party known as the Union of the Right. Um, which was dedicated to the reversal of uh, anti-clerical legislation uh, at the time and the full restoration of the French monarchy. Now, just keep that in mind, because as I say, it's a few years later that he starts spending lavishly. And for me, there there is also something else that happens, actually, which... um, like I say, just might whet the appetite a little bit more. There is an apparent link between the Habsburgs and uh, Sonia. Um, so the, it, it, it's alleged, and I would just say it's alleged, um, that um, one of the um, uh, uh, one of the archdukes. Uh, so this is uh, Johann von Habsburg. Um, is apparently in 18 February of 1890. Uh, is apparently uh, cited, or it's alleged that he visits uh, Sonia. Now, I think it, it, it's odd that an archduke would sort of stroll into Republican France and go to an obscure village that's very difficult to get up to. But there is this, this sort of lingering whisper of some Habsburg um, connection. And I think that would make a hell of a lot of sense because it's really from the 1890s that Sonia starts this huge spending spree. So my speculation, if indeed, uh, uh, I suppose I'm allowed to, uh, but my speculation is the money came from the Habsburg um, uh, uh, emperor, um, or the empire, we should uh, make it more accurate, um, and was given to Sonia to um, um, basically uh, support the restoration of a monarchy that would be the uh, an alliance with with Austria, uh, as opposed to the um, other alliances that were forming between uh, Britain, um, uh, eventually uh, France, with the Triple Entente, and then uh, eventually through France with with Russia. But the marriage alliance with the Britain had with a lot of other countries. Of course, Austria didn't really have that alliance. So you, you can see there's a few manoeuvrings going on, and it certainly wouldn't be the first time in history um, that another power has uh, seeked to uh, influence an, another uh, country's. Uh, uh, democratic processes, and uh, certainly we only need to look to to the UK and uh, the US um, uh, to see that happening today. Uh, soft power, um, you, you, you know, you don't bribe the head of a country, but what you do is, you know, key players in particular regions, uh, and certainly um, I, I think there's a lot of mileage in that theory. Uh, I would also say that before Sonia died, uh, he died relatively poor in 1917. So my speculation is the money tap cut off with the onset of the First World War. Um, But again, just to, uh, we can see from, he was an obsessive with his uh, financial accounts, which if you don't have much money when he's starting off, I suppose you have to be. 
but he spent 229,351 francs on land and building works and uh, 465,000 pounds on consumption of food and drink uh, in a 10 year period. Um, uh, it, just to try and put that into uh, 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 modern money, we, we are talking two, three, four, five million euros at least. Um, you know, he built his own home, which is called the Villa Bethania, um, uh, which was the uh, sort of name for uh, Bethany uh, at the turn of the century. That cost 90,000 francs. Um, you know, which is uh, almost as much as the uh, Chateau de Hofour, uh, which was a, a huge stately uh, home. So we're not talking again small, small money. Uh, the gardens for the Villa Bethania currently occupy uh, or are currently used by a restaurant, um, the Jardin de Marie, um, uh, uh, owner Morgan. Um, who uh, does a very good job up there and uh, uh, looks after the, uh, the garden uh, uh, very well. So there is still, uh, it's still preserved if anyone wants to go up there. Uh, uh, the Villa Bethany is now a museum, but you can, you can see just how much money uh, was spent. And of course, but whilst we can look at his accounts, this is only his declared spending. So we know that there's plenty of structures in the village that he um, had uh, paid for. He built, as I say, a, a huge tower fully uh, with books, magazines, antique furniture, tens of thousands again. Um, so where did it come from? Um, now, could it be that... Uh, the Archduke had an interest in uh, Rennes Le Chateau for its uh, um, Visigothic origin, shall we say. It's possible. Could it be that the Archduke uh, had an interest in the area because of the, it being the pathway uh, of many armies, um, both crusading in the area or crusading to the Middle East uh, or um, a particular interest because of the border with Spain, which was once up to it. There's lots of ideas floating around. I think the official idea, which, um, or I should say, the nearly official idea is that uh, the um, African uh, von Habsburg was wanting to study uh, farming techniques from a priest. I think we can last that idea out. It'd be very unusual. And certainly a priest on such a rocky outcrop is, uh, is very odd. Um, so, like I said, that, that's my uh, uh, speculation. Um, but, the, the, like I say, the, uh, the mystery uh, inside the church, um, there's depictions of Jesus, uh, um, being, well, I don't know, being buried or being removed um, uh, from uh, the cave in which his body was either laid to rest or, or moved. But the issue with that painting, and again, we're in a uh, we're in a uh, religious building, uh, is that uh, it clearly depicts that the moon is um, is out. It's a full moon. Well, unfortunately, due to Jewish tradition, bodies can't be moved in or out of anywhere uh, at night. So, is in fact Jesus alive? You can certainly see where the mysteries begin to... Uh, some things that just don't quite make uh, a lot of sense. Um, it, it, it is also possible that uh, all of this money came from a um, treasure associated with the Hopepool family. There's certainly some connections with um, with um, uh, Sonia and the Hopepool family. His his brother um, was the uh, abbey uh, near the chateau of uh, Hopepool, 
um, and the Hopal family, quite a prominent family uh, with the monks of Malta. Um, but but who knows? Um, in essence, um, so this is where the uh, the, the Da Vinci codes um, sort of left us. It it it, it, it caused such a sensation um, when the uh, the book was released. Um, what I think 15 years ago now, maybe a little longer. Um, and the uh, the village uh, sits there, um, sort of asking questions. It, it's a, uh, a deeply uh, mysterious uh, uh, place. Now, I will mention for a sort of pause for some uh, questions, maybe. But the Holy Blood, Holy Grail um, speculation of, you know, where did Sonia get his money from? Um, again, goes back to the documents, um, or the parchments that he apparently discovered um, that proved that uh, um, the Merovingians were descendants of Jesus and Mary Magdalene, and that um, Jesus had in fact been married, and that um, essentially. Um, these were confirmed in the Gnostic Gospels um, that you know, he's described uh, as, uh, you know, kissing, uh, or is it kissing? Uh, do we actually know? But kissing whom? Was it Mary? You know, we, we don't know. Um, and that in Matthew twenty six forty nine, Jesus is described as a rabbi. Um, and in order to be a rabbi, you have to uh, have to be married, and that um, you know uh, Mary was the person associated with looking after Jesus' body after he was crucified, um, which would have been very highly inappropriate. Um, so uh, this is where uh, the, the the sort of speculation begins. Now th- there's there's no evidence that uh, he ended up in France, but the legend um, or the speculation is entirely uh, dependent upon the uh, Priory of Sion, um, uh, which, according to the Holy Blood, Holy Grail, was founded in 1099 to guard the secrets of, uh, of this bloodline. Um so yes, uh, there's this very tenuous link with um, he'd found this money and then bribed officials, maybe, or whatever. Um, and the last thing to say on on this uh, is the Gerard de Set and Pierre Planta, who wrote the book that spawned the Holy Blood, Holy Grail, which then spawned the Da Vinci Code. And the um, Plantar was probably as uh, politically um, uh, unusual, maybe, as Sonia was. Plantar was uh, a known Nazi. Um, And uh, certainly, in my view, a, a fantasist. But we, we then um, sort of then have to look, well, okay, well, if he is a fantasist then, and Lincoln has based his work entirely on someone's, you know, thoughts and musings, okay, well, it, we, we should approach this mystery with uh, with caution and we should uh, say, well, it's a good bit of fiction maybe. doesn't explain where the money came from. Um, nor does it really explain... Um, what the Nazis were doing in the area either. Um, so uh, various uh, 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 stories, rumours, but we, we actually know for sure um, of, um, uh, believe it or not, a gay Jewish Nazi. Um, wow, yes. So... 
<laughs> yes, it's uh, it, that might it come as a bit of a surprise, and certainly um, a, a gay Jewish Nazi who didn't realise he was working for Goebbels. Um, I know uh, <laughs> if you've been with me so far, just hold on, carry on. Um, yeah, uh, a gentleman called Otto Rahm, who was very interested in the area surrounding. Um, uh, not just Renly Chateau, but the the Ord um, and the Ariège, places like Montségur, which is famous if you know anything about the Cathars. They, when they were uh, uh, making their last stand, um, they did so at Montségur, um, and then they were uh, were burned. But yeah, what, what the Nazis were doing in the area, very interested indeed. And also, Ron didn't realise he was working for Goebbels. And certainly, when he had outlived his usefulness, disappeared in some very hard to believe uh, set of circumstances. Um, so, yes, the, the I, I would caution people. Um, so, any of you listeners that are uh, thinking, oh, this sounds like something that could really get me my teeth into. Yes, I'm sure you will be able to. And yes, uh, it will be good fun, but it has to come with a, just a little bit of a warning. Once you get your, uh, your feet wet in this, it will begin to open up more and more mysteries, more and more questions. Um, so if anyone wants to, uh, if any of your listeners do want to uh, get in touch with me, best way to do it is either on Facebook, which is J Martin, or on Twitter, CPT James Martin. Uh, I don't know if you have any, any further questions on, on the area or anything that you've read, Michael. I think a lot of being, has been covered there, obviously, um, even though you say you can go deeper and deeper into it. Um, and one thing you would say is that is that a lot of the history that that's that's given in the mainstream doesn't really even begin to cover what might have happened or what, um, or sometimes completely sketches over entire large histories like that. I mean, that for example, I don't think any of this would have been taught in school. For example, um, as, you know, I don't well, think certainly in the area, and no, not in France. A lot of the history of um, Occitania, of the Cathars, are not taught in, in France. And certainly, it, it, it's a very niche subject. Um, but again, that health warning. If you um, believe that history is just a series of kings and queens, if you start looking into this, uh, you should do so with a, a healthy dose of scepticism but crucially with an open mind, because you'll find there are particular truths um, uh, buried within this uh, particular field um, that will, uh, and not just open your eyes, can be very overwhelming, actually. Um, so when you, you, you start to look at uh, the Cathars and Templars and, you know, then some of the uh, beliefs and then you know, uh, I remember when I first started um, uh, visiting that area and ended up in uh, a cave uh, a place called Neo looking at some paintings that are 20 to 28,000 years old something like that um, and it being explained that what I thought were cut wounds in the animals weren't and you know, sort of questions, you know, well, of course they are. Look, it looks exactly like blood. And it's like, no, we, we know how they would draw blood. This isn't it. Um, and, you know, you could see in crossing out, but this idea of, uh, you know, of cavemen. So in my uh, sort of simple mind, uh, you know, thinking of cavemen as literally you know, people who live in caves. Uh, um, no, not at all. Uh, uh, some of these um, cave drawings are kilometres inside cave systems. And when when he's told, well, no, if you lived in a cave, 
and the light went out, you'd be dead. And there's no evidence of sacrifice of any type within this, within these structures. And that blew my mind. There's no such thing as cavemen. And it makes sense. No, if, you, if you're living in the, um, uh, you know, the opening of the cave may be fine, but not within these systems. So little things like that. Um, uh, certainly little things like that. And things that might be dismissed as conspiracy, shall we say, uh, you'll actually discover there's a, a lot of fact. Uh, so I'll leave I'll leave your listeners with one of the questions from the uh, from the area. What happened to the Templars' uh, gold, and most crucially, what happened with the Templars? That in itself is a question that will open many doors. Okay, well, well, thanks for that. Looking looking in detail there at an area which is accessible in popular culture with the Da Vinci Code, but then we get we get through to all of this. The Ren Le Chateau in southwestern France with Jay Martin.